Um, well, thank you for that introduction, um, and thank you for having me here at Cardiff. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted to be invited. It's been a very stimulating uh, couple of days for me, um, and very nice to be in a kind of all-nuclear environment, as it were. Um, quite a lot of the time, uh, I'm uh, uh, you know, justifying my work to uh, other governmental scientists and other, other people with, from different perspectives. So. It's nice to have something focused directly on my area of empirical research. Um, so yes, uh, hopefully uh, I'm going to add something to the proceedings that, that we haven't seen. I'm using uh, a political discourse theory perspective. So this is a qualitative perspective. Um, and we've seen uh, over the past couple of days, past few sessions, some very nice statistical analysis, some very nice uh, polling analysis, broad-based statistical uh, picture of, of uh, where nuclear stands uh, in, in various different contexts. I'm specifically going to talk about the, the UK context. This has been uh, the focus of my PhD uh, and policy change in the UK. Um, but yeah, hopefully I'm going to uh, supplement some of these uh, analyses that we've seen with uh, a kind of approach to the nitty-gritty of the, of the politics of, of nuclear power. So um, first of all, I'll say a little something about political discourse theory because um, certainly, the, <laughs> certainly my uh, my perspective on it is that it's uh, slightly marginalised, not very well known. Speci specifically, the type I do, which is uh, specific to the University of Essex. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll just give you a little uh, introduction to it. Um, political discourse theory kind of starts from the premise that uh, everything is political and everything is discursive. Um, so uh, this uh, means that we have to wonder why some things are more important than others on political agendas. Now, uh, this is done through three types of logic, or uh, political logic, discursive logic. Um, so the first type, social logics, are essentially practices and signifiers that are depoliticized. So in the case of, uh, of energy policy and, and uh, energy use, we might think of uh, turning on a light switch is essentially a depoliticized action. You turn on a light switch, and hopefully if your light, light bulb hasn't blown or you've, and you've paid your electricity bill, uh, the light comes on, using any kind of application, uh, any kind of uh, you know, application of electricity usually has, has that connotation. Um, political logics are the way in which uh, discursive signifiers and, and objects are uh, interpolated essentially and become either depoliticized or politicized right so this is done through uh, what is called a, a logic of equivalence and difference this is essentially drawing lines around things uh, creating inside groups and outside groups um, and so the, the practice of politics is essentially deciding what we want to hold constant and deciding what we want to change and problem problematizing the things that we want to change and uh, deproblematizing, depoliticizing the things we want to keep the same. Um, and uh, this takes place in a context generally of uh, what is described in the theory as dislocation. Um, and this is usually uh, some kind of event that needs interpretation. So uh, we've seen, for example, that. Um, uh, you know, we, we might think the Fukushima accident, for example, is a prime uh, example of, a, of a, a kind of dislocated, possible dislocation uh, of nuclear power. Um, but as I'm hopefully going to show, uh, events don't interpret themselves. They, they require political interpretation. So uh, hopefully this is going to go some way to explain or at least provide some kind of interpretation of... Uh, uh, Wouter's findings that uh, there's a, a sharp decrease in support for nuclear power in the UK post Fukushima and then a very quickly a tick back upwards and hopefully I'm going to provide some kind of interpretation of, of why that might be. Uh, the final part of, of political discourse theory is uh, what are termed phantasmatic logics and these are essentially the way in which uh, discourses grip subjects why subjects care about them. So this is usually emotive and normative content. Um, and very, very simply, this can be through um, the construction of 
what are termed their beatific and horrific images. So uh, nightmare visions or utopian visions provide the kind of uh, emotive grip for, to the, the uh, mean subjects want to actually be involved in political projects. So in the case of uh, certain aspects of green discourse, for example, it might be that there's a, a kind of uh, green self-sufficient utopia where uh, we're not harming the environment, we're living in harmony with it. Um, by contrast, there may be technical utopia images as well of uh, you know, increased scientific uh, control and to the extent that human beings can live fantastic lives. Right? Um, but usually these are coupled with the nightmare vision of the alternative. So uh, from, from green uh, discourse, we might say, okay, on the one hand, we can have this wonderful green utopia where we're living in harmony, and the, the alternative is uh, a terrible dystopia where uh, you know, essentially something like um, uh, some of the films we've seen about climate change, right? Nature rising up against humanity and destroying it in some way. Um, but obviously, these are, there are various ways this can be done. So political discourse theory generally says that the content of these things can be just em empirically looked at. We, d we don't want to a priori say uh, we expect a certain thing to, to exist. So I think that's enough about um, this kind of theory. It's usually, <laughs> it's usually the best way with sort of post-structuralist uh, theory to get the theory out of the way early and then ignore it for a little while and, and come back to it in the conclusion. So, so I, I, I have two focal points that I'm, I'm going to try and uh, aim at uh, in this presentation. So the first is uh, how is the Fukushima accident dealt with discursively? And this is, again, in the UK. Um, and like I say, hopefully this is going to um, provide some kind of political interpretation of what was going on uh, in 2011 in the UK uh, and uh, how uh, such a, an apparently, uh, on the face of it, uh, an event that would provide a dislocation to nuclear power in the UK ended up not doing so. Um, and then secondly, um, oh, I'm also going to uh, spend a little time very little time uh, comparing some of the, res the, the response to Fukushima with some of the responses to other nuclear accidents, specifically Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. Um, so, yeah, secondly, I'm going to uh, try and examine why there is a gov governmental preference against changing this policy. So, hopefully in the first uh, half of the talk, I show you how it was done. But then the question remains, okay, why does the government retain this, pre this preference for for nuclear power in the first place. Why should the government want to uh, deal with the accident in this way, um, rather than deciding to change its policy, right? Um, so, um, there was a multi-pronged strategy in place uh, following the Fukushima accident in the UK. Um, and so here we are focusing primarily on political logics, okay? so. Uh, creating in-groups and out-groups and uh, equivalence and difference. Um, and one of the most important ways of, of uh, dealing with the, the accident was distancing the industry from the problematic reactor. Now, this has been the case in, in other accidents as well. So the aim is actually uh, almost to uh, set up, a blo if you remember uh, Nick Pigeon's Swiss cheese model yesterday, um, the aim is to try and put some cheese in the way of the holes of the other slices of the Swiss cheese, right? And distance the, the industry from the problematic reactor. So this was done um, partly by talking about uh, the age of the design. So the, the quote there is from George Monbiot in The Guardian, very shortly afterwards. Uh, uh, he's a, a crucial figure in this as he's a very prominent green uh, journalist very kind of well respected in the green in, in the green uh, industry in the green movement um, and very shortly after fukushima happened he came out and said fukushima has uh, changed my mind on nuclear i now support it um, and here's why uh, and so yes his quote is that it was a, a crappy old plant with inadequate safety features as he puts it um, with the implication that we've learned from the designs we've done in the 60s and 70s um, and now they're better. Um, and so we can, we can dismiss this reactor as uh, problematizing the whole industry because the industry has moved on. So we shouldn't be held hostage to, to uh, this accident. Um, this was coupled actually with uh, another approach of 
uh, the idea that the reactors were holding up well in spite of this age. So, uh, as we've seen, um, it, it, much was made of the idea that there were no lethal doses of radiation. Nobody actually died from uh, radiation poisoning. Um, <coughs> there was also a, a, a move to kind of focus on the plant to obscure the safety efforts that make the, the relatively benign, uh, in terms of death, uh, outcome for, of the actual nuclear accident, um, th that actually obscures the reasons why that might not have occurred, notwithstanding Malcolm's objection that um, evacuation is a dangerous process, indeed. Um, there was also a very interesting use of uh, an argument of bad taste. So it was uh, put in, in, in various different um, publications. There was uh, particularly one in the Telegraph and also, I think, in the Register, uh, the, the internet uh, technical newspaper, um, that focusing on uh, the nuclear aspect of the, the accident, the, of, the, of the earthquake, sorry, um, was actually in bad taste because so many people had died from a tsunami and, uh, and uh, an earthquake at the time and no one had actually died from uh, the nuclear accident. Spending so much uh, ink and, and internet print, I don't know what the equivalent would be, um, in uh, discussing the nuclear situation was actually uh, in poor taste and, and the focus should have been on uh, the victim's suffering, as uh, is, is often the case, as Karin was showing, actually, maybe not so much the, the case in the international news media. Um, it was also an attempt to, to bring victory from defeat, and as, as I've kind of mentioned, George, uh, George Monbiot, uh, this was a prime, prime example of, of uh, this form of argumentation. So it was actually that... Um, the, the old plant was surviving in the face of unforeseen adversity. So it's a kind of, uh, as, as we've seen earlier, act of God argument. There was, a, there was an act of God going on. Who could possibly know that such a terrible uh, event would happen? Um, and even when it has happened, and even when it's happened to a plant that was designed very early on and is not very good, uh, it has still survived. I mean, this is very early on. This is within three days of, of the earthquake. Um, and, of course, the implication is that, uh, and it, it's a, a fairly convincing argument, that Britain generally doesn't face tsunamis and massive earthquakes, so what, what do we have to worry about? It's a, a peculiarly Japanese problem. Um, so the aim, then, is to, is to show Fukushima actually as a triumph for nuclear. Instead of it being this... Uh, so we'd, we'd expect there to be some kind of dislocation just on the face of the, the idea that accidents look bad for the nuclear industry. Um, but the, the approach was to reverse that, actually reverse the, the discourse and say, no, well, far from, far from showing that it's a, a, a terrible uh, event for nuclear, it shows how, how safe the nuclear industry is uh, because nobody's died of a lethal dose of, dose of radiation and, and so forth. Um, and as I've said before, yes, uh, George Monbiot is important for this. He's a key green actor. But uh, it's also important to note that this uh, multi-pronged strategy was agreed at the governmental level. There was uh, a strong uh, element of uh, coordination between uh, government and the nuclear industry. Um, and the Guardian uh, did a freedom of information request and got a load of emails showing that uh, very, you know, a, a one particular civil servant very shortly after the, the uh, accident was, was making news said, OK, we need to take the ground and hold it from the nuclear chaps and chapesses in a very British sort of um, civil service way, very Sir Humphrey. Um, and, the, and this went round to uh, Aviva and EDF and Westinghouse and so on and so forth. And this strategy was agreed across it. You can see in the emails that they say, OK, this is how we should do it. I think we should say, actually, it's holding up very well. It's, you know, so we can actually draw all these things from these emails and then go back to the media reporting and see how well it translates across. And it translates across fantastically well. It's very, very obvious that the, the two are connected. Um, and I've said there actually, so, so it aims at showing Fukushima is a triumph for nuclear. I've said it's actually a triumph for, for the emergency services, but we could say something more broad than that, and this is always the, what we try and do in discourse theory. You try and take a sort of uh, 
big picture if we possibly can. And we might actually say that it's uh, more a triumph for the kind of surrounding social settlement to nuclear as a technology. So um, again, with a Swiss cheese model, we have the nuclear part of society failing, but the other parts surrounding it actually uh, come in and, and help deal uh, with the problem. Um, so yes, as, a, as I've kind of alluded to in the previous slide, there was a high level of coordination between industry and government. Um, analogies with war were very common in the emails, taking the ground and holding it and uh, taking the fight to the green uh, camp and things like that were all uh, used as, as kind of analogies, metaphors. Um, and this highly contrasts with, in particular, Three Mile Island. Um, it, from my kind of research on the response to the governmental and industry responses to Three Mile Island, particularly in America, there were multiple competing uh, expert views. There was no centralised coordination between uh, actors. Uh, government was saying one thing, industry was saying another, managers were saying yet another thing. Uh, some, you know, there was, there was even confusion over evacuation, who should be evacuated, should it just be children, uh, pregnant women, uh, and so forth. And once you get the uh, sort of uh, ABC American coverage of it, lots of vox pop uh, pieces to camera where they are talking to people who say, I, I don't know what is going on, I'm panicking, so I'm just going to evacuate myself, which is kind of not a very good bit of risk communication, as it were, <laughs> as we, we've seen from uh, yesterday. Um, so, if anything, uh, the, the nuclear industry has definitely learned how to deal with accidents in a, in a, uh, a public response, at least in Britain. I mean, we've seen that maybe TEPCO and the Japanese government's response was far less adequate in that, in that uh, regard. But then I suppose they were under a, a lot more pressure. Um, so we also saw, yeah, deferral of requests for comments to industry bodies. So industry bodies like uh, the NIA uh, become very important here. Um, and this prevents connection with company brands. There's, there's some email evidence where someone from Westinghouse is saying, um, if we keep on being asked for comment, but we're going to refer everything to the industry body because the last thing we need is Westinghouse's name being put anywhere near this accident. So ultimately, um, the move is to say it's, uh, in the long run, this is. So initially, the move is to say we distance ourselves from the reactor, but we also say that it's holding up surprisingly well. Um, and then when it turns out that it's not holding up that well, um, you know, we get to December and it's uh, only just being stabilised, uh, ultimately it's a move to say it's the operator's fault and it's the design of the plant. And, and, and as we've seen, there's quite a lot of truth in, in this. You know, putting your um, fuel rods, spent fuel rods near your reactor and things like that, not, not excellent ideas. Um, so on the one hand, it's still this unforeseen uh, circumstance to a certain extent, but it's also failure to plan for unforeseen circumstances and failure to run uh, properly uh, the, the plant. So this is a, a move that others the offending reactor. So you, you push the reactor away from the industry and the broader political project is safe. You lose one slice of Swiss cheese, but you keep the rest of the block, as it were. Um, and this occurred very much with Chernobyl and, and Three Mile Island as well. And this is a, a, on, uh, from, a, from a kind of Western uh, perspective uh, on both of these. But it, and I'll talk a little bit about specifically British. But for, for Chernobyl, it was relatively easy to other the offending uh, reactor because you could talk about communism, right? Um, you could basically say, communists don't know how to run this technology. They have a terrible idea about safety, which is, uh, has you know, quite a bit of truth to it. Um, and actually, the initial uh, report from the Soviets blamed operators very strongly. It's only after uh, the Soviet Union collapses in 1991, that it's then revised to say, okay, it's a general culture that we had in communism and that was really bad. But initially it was a move to simply blame uh, people on the ground at the time doing a, a foolish procedure. But in the West, of course, you could just say, well, it's communist and we, we have better designs. Uh, for Three Mile Line, that's slightly uh, more problematic because, of course, it's a Western reactor, it's an American reactor. Um, 
Now, in America, there, uh, in the initial report, uh, re government report into the accident six months after it, um, there was uh, quite a bit about industry culture being poor, um, and as we've seen about sort of socio-technical complex systems, uh, that actually sort of feeds into that, that idea quite well. Um, and there's also, there was also some blaming of, uh, of operators. But it was also very interesting, and uh, I'll just say maybe a quick word, about um, a particular construction that's very interesting in that report, which is that the design of nuclear power is kind of, um, I don't know what the word would be, valorized, I suppose. Uh, the design doesn't have designers in, in the report. The design exists, and then people use it. And human error equals operator error. So designers, essentially, we can maybe take from that, aren't human. <laughs> They're essentially... Um, you know, d designing, you know, in the, uh, in the royal sense of designing, or in the biblical sense of designing, perhaps. Um, and uh, from a British perspective, Three Mile Island was a, was a fascinating uh, uh, way of, res there was a fascinating way of responding to it, because at the time, Britain had a nationalised uh, nuclear industry that uh, on and off was attempting to prevent American reactors come in, coming into the UK. Um, so, it was possible to argue that uh, Three Mile Island happened because the American industry was too capitalist uh, in the sense that it was too focused on profit and not focused enough on safety. Um, whereas Britain, with a, a nationalised industry, was able to focus on safety. And quite a lot of the arguments when they were pushing forward uh, the advanced gas reactors uh, in comparison to pressurised water reactors was they're not pressurised, they're more inherently safe, um, so uh, they're worth a bit more money than, uh, than the American one, it's, but it's fine to spend a bit more money. While simultaneously, of course, saying, saying that you wouldn't have to spend more money. Uh, such is politics. Um, Fukushima, as, as we can see, is a more advanced strategy than either of these. It's not just uh, othering a reactor and abandoning it and saying, well, it's the fault of the people who are, who are running it or the, their particular culture. Um, in fact, of course, we see with Fukushima that in, in some of the media reports that um, it's considered as a very Japanese accident, uh, which is a similar kind of move. But it's a, a more advanced strategy because it is also uh, shifting to the opposite extreme. It's the, it's the claim to make it as a victory. So there's a, a dual kind of um, almost uh, paradoxical move where, where both these things are occurring simultaneously. So, as I say, yeah, ultimately, this is uh, protecting the broader political project by abandoning smaller elements of that project. So, reactors are smaller ele elements of a larger nuclear industry. So, yeah, just before I um, move on to the second half, I'll take a little sip of water. So, if we know, broadly speaking, or at least I've provided an interpretation, uh, how uh, government and industry tried to uh, deal with this accident, we should reasonably ask why would the government want to do so? Um, and I should say at this point uh, as well that because everything is uh, discursive and political in political discourse theory, uh, which means you can uh, talk about any subject you like, and lots of people do, um, <laughs> whether they know anything about it or not, uh, it, it's very important to note that uh, all actors are considered to be engaging in political uh, activity. So, uh, in this section I'm going to discuss uh, how we got to having nuclear power policy in the UK where we wanted to build more reactors. Um, but it's, it's uh, important to bear in mind that uh, people promoting renewable energy, people pr promoting coal, gas and so forth, anyone with any kind of skin in this game is going to be uh, acting strategically and trying to further their interests. So, um, essentially, uh, Malcolm, don't take this personally. Uh, changing minds on nuclear took a, a lot of time. This is my doctoral work, which I'm uh, submitting next, uh, next week, actually. Um, so, I'm kind of skiving off uh, here. But, um, uh, so, from 2003 to 2006, there was a very strong campaign uh, centred around uh, the group supporters of nuclear energy, which Malcolm is a, a, a member of, um, or at least he was uh, for many years. 
Um, whether he still is now, I don't know, but maybe he can tell us. Uh, so, uh, directly after this 2003 white paper, there was a, the, the, in 2003 we had a white paper in the UK which said, we don't want any nuclear power, please. Um, ideally, we'd, we'd like more renewables. Now, it was a very lukewarm set of proposals, <laughs> and uh, one of the things I do in my doctoral work is look at why that might have been the case. Um, and one of the reasons, I think, is that the, uh, the renewables lobby didn't really put forward a very convincing argument that, that the government could be convinced by that renewables could provide uh, the kind of uh, scale of, uh, the, to deal with their projected energy demand. Um, so, but directly after this white paper, when the media were reporting kind of the death knell of the nuclear industry in the UK, uh, so the supporters of nuclear energy get a tip-off from a, a Labour MP, um, according to their newsletter, who says, if you want to get any new nuclear power in the UK ever again, you have to start talking about climate change. Um, now, uh, this is initially met with scepticism in this group. Uh, Bernard Ingham is the, is the secretary of this group. He is uh, a fairly prominent climate sceptic. Um, he is strongly pro-nuclear, strongly anti-renewables. Um, and so his initial response to this is that this is disingenuous nonsense, is what he says. We, we shouldn't do this. Um, but the very next month, he's working out how they can do this in, the, in their newsletter. So he's nothing if not a practical man. Uh, and you don't, you don't get to be Margaret Thatcher's press secretary by not having some kind of political nous, right? Um, so climate change has to be used to overcome privatisation. In, in my doctoral work, I uh, put forward the idea that privatisation of the energy market in the UK was the crucial uh, kind of... Uh, thing that knocked nuclear uh, on the head. Um, it, since 1995, no investment. Since 1989, really, no, no investment. Um, and basically, no privatised companies wanted to spend any money on it. Um, but they also push... They have a six-point strategy. I won't go through, it, through all six points here. But um, one of the moves is to drop their objection to renewables and say, on the whole, actually, we're not against renewables. We don't think they're, they're very good, but if you want to spend money and, and do them, that's fine. But you should realise that you can't do everything you want to do with renewables alone. That's just not going to happen. And so this signifier of a balanced energy mix comes, uh, comes through. Uh, and what a balanced energy mix does, of course, is that it says uh, things that are in the balanced energy mix are, are sensible. And people who are criticising things that are in the balanced energy mix are not sensible, they're, they're unreasonable essentially. So it allows you to paint particularly green people who are against nuclear power, because a lot of them are, as completely unreasonable. They, all they want is a renewables future, that's not a balanced energy mix. And this was, this was very effective, in fact this helped frame the 2006 uh, consultation. Um, and so very early on actually it's very interesting that the supporters of nuclear energy have what is described as a chairman's lunch uh, with Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth, presumably asking them whether they want to support this, this campaign, and Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth say, thanks for the lunch, but no thanks. <laughs> um, so the, the main kind of influence of this group is their influential members. They don't have very much money, they don't, uh, you know, they're not like Greenpeace, where Greenpeace have lots of members and lots of churn of members and multi-million pounds, and that's how they run. They have instead uh, very useful Rolodexes, you know, very good address books. Um, crucially, James Lovelock is a member of this group. He's been a member of this group for a very long time. This was not reported uh, when he was uh, kind of portrayed as this green uh, Damascene conversion kind of guy. Uh, he's this wonderful green theorist, and now he's saying it's nuclear power, and this is all a big shock. Actually, it's not. He'd, he'd thought of this for a long time. Um, and his article in 2004 that kind of kick-starts this whole debate follows Soane's six-point strategy to five of its points, and the only one it doesn't mention is cost, which is basically the, the weakest argument uh, for nuclear. So um, he's, a, he's an influential member, Bernard Ingham, as I've mentioned. Uh, Lord, uh, Jack Cunningham, this is the, the Labour, former Labour MP. Lord McAlpine is a construction magnate. Uh, various BNFL and uh, Nuclear Industry Association high-ranking 
uh, officials are in this group. Uh, Keith Parker is a member of this group, who's the, the chair, I think it is, of uh, the NIA. So their importance is their influence. And why is there, there there's some kind of um, confusion and nebulous nature, I should say at this point, in, in policy analysis of what the state is. We'd like to think that groups in civil society set out to convince the state, as it were. Um, but what this case kind of shows to me is that it's far more complicated than that. So we see a member of the government, so I mean, the, the Labour Party historically has had a, a pro-nuclear wing um, and an, an anti-nuclear wing. Um, and for various reasons, you know, um, good socialist reasons, one might say, in the, in the 70s and 80s, they quite like nuclear power because of uh, the importance of unions, uh, the importance of undermining the coal union and getting, getting a bit more power back to the central government, but also because of the promise of economic growth and technical growth, and that's been a strong theme in socialism anyway. So both socialism and capitalism are pro-growth in, in that sense. Um, but well, yeah, so it, it's, it's fascinating to me anyway that it doesn't seem to be so much about convincing different members of the state, although that, that's important, but it's also about where it is we think the line is being drawn uh, between state and civil society. So again, it's back to political logics of equivalence and difference. Rather than going, this institution or that institution is part of the state and these ones are not, it's far more productive to say, why is this line being drawn in a certain way and where is it being drawn? So in the case of Sohn, it gets very interesting because, of course, they're doing the work for a Labour MP who wants nuclear power to occur. There, there are lots of various different people who want nuclear power to occur. And what they do, I argue, is set the political context in which a decision for nuclear power can be made. It's quite likely that Tony Blair was pro-nuclear prior to 2003. Certainly when they had the 2003 white paper come through, Brian Wilson was in charge of it, and he is pro-nuclear. Um, uh, but shortly after that, Tony Blair starts saying in public, I have fought long and hard to keep this option on the, on the table. Um, so this, this gives us an interesting idea about political power, right? If, if the prime minister of the country wants to make a decision, it isn't simply that he, he makes the decision and things happen, although that can occur. Uh, it's, it's more, it's, it's even, even the prime minister has to be concerned about, uh, and certainly Tony Blair was a master of being concerned about public opinion and whether he's going to win an election. Um, so, but anyway, sure. Um, so to return to uh, why government might uh, protect nuclear, uh, crucial, I think, and, and I think what the 2003 white paper did not do is protection of social logic, so protection of current ways of life. Uh, current ways of interpolation of humans within the uh, electrical system, basically. Um, and that, that's not adequately done by, by the 2003 white paper. I think it's, it doesn't uh, convince people who are, who are highly worried about meeting demand. Um, but it's also, ha having done that and, and having uh, done this work, we've, we've seen this... Uh, support of nuclear energy work has been done. Uh, if, if we get to Fukushima and we see there's, there's a large accident, um, this is, so this is 2003 to 2006 we've had this, this changing of minds and we've seen it in the polling data. Um, once we get to 2011, lots of other political work has been done. Sites, licensing, planning battles, uh, con concerns over waste have tried to be dealt with. And so there's a lot of sunk costs, as it were, sunk political costs that need to be protected. So that's, that's one thing. But it all, it's also crucial to note that so, saying no to nuclear in the, in, after this accident actually means going back to the drawing board and energy policy. It blows a massive hole in government energy policy because they're hoping to have essentially a third nuclear, a third renewables, a third well, gas, broadly speaking. Um, so that's a, a huge political cost. If you abandon that, suddenly you're open to all sorts of accusations that you don't know what you're doing on energy policy, your energy policy is in disarray, 
uh, what are you going to do about energy policy and so forth. So it's important to protect that. Um, and uh, really, the, the, the place of nuclear in energy policy comes into an idea about politics of unsustainability. This is a, a, a concept from uh, a professor at Bath in Gulf of Bluton, which is a, a very good uh, concept, I think, which is essentially that what we intend to do with most of our responses to, to sustainability problems is maintain lifestyles sans carbon. So it's about reducing sustainability down to, and this is done in the policy documents, by the way, from 2003, there's a wide definition of sustainability. 2006, it is carbon emissions that equals sustainability. Uh, so once we reduce sustainability and green politics down to carbon, nuclear starts to make more sense. And the 2003 white paper tried to do this, um, and the nuclear guys were able to, to capitalize on this. Um, demand is depoliticized, so lifestyles are depoliticized. So once we say we expect demand to rise uh, and we expect demand to be this, and we don't say, why is it we demand this much electricity in the first place and maybe we shouldn't, which would be a green response, uh, this produces the uh, there is no alternative argument. We have this much demand, we must meet it somehow. How are we going to meet it? The same argument occurs with um, the expansion of Heathrow as well. We're going to expand the number of uh, passengers exponentially. How are we going to meet this demand? We're just going to have a, if we don't expand our airports, we're going to have congestion. It's going to be terrible. Whether this, these demand projections are any good or not is, is always a, a, a political and a technical question. So what we see is phantasmatic logics and social logics working together. Uh, the loss of so current social logics is the horrific image, right? Uh, the idea that the lifestyle you have now will not work uh, is used very effectively, in fact, in a 2004 BBC uh, special called If the Lights Go Out, in which a fictional minister says the immortal words, uh, I never thought I'd say this, but come back nuclear power, all is forgiven. Um, and so we see, this is, this is the phantasmatic logic. Uh, the lights are out, the minister is facing death threats. Uh, what a disaster, right? So the social logics and the phantasmatic logics work together there. So, yeah, to, to uh, quickly answer our questions that we, we set up, uh, the Fukushima accident is dealt with in the UK by distancing the reactor from the wider industry, by saying it's an old, weak design, it's down to TEPCO errors, it's down to an act of God but also simultaneously claiming a victory for the wider industry. No radiation deaths, despite the fact that it's an old design under intense pressure. Um, and so we have seen the political logics of equivalence and difference there at work. Uh, we've also seen why, hopefully, an interpretation at least of why the nuclear industry might be protected. It's because there's lots of sunk political costs. Uh, gaining public acceptance took quite a while. We can see Wouter's uh, polls as they slowly climb their way up. Um, plus, the ancillary work of en enacting policy is also a political cost. Um, and we also can say that we have nuclear in the first place because of a, an idea of politics of unsustainability. We want to depoliticize lifestyles, and we want to have technological op optimism. This can often be considered a, an ideology of ecological modernization. This is a kind of separate topic, perhaps. So the phantasmatic and social logics work together to produce the idea that there is no alternative. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.